Welcome, welcome, welcome to Physics with Miss Lisa. That's me. And the, this is a class primarily for homeschoolers, but if you like the way I explain something, feel free to watch. Um, and what we are going through is we're going to talk about chapter two in this book, but um, you don't have to have that book to learn the concepts. And what we're going to be talking a lot about today is the math of physics. Um, the language of science often involves the language of math. So as scientists, we need to be able to communicate with each other worldwide. So we need to be able to agree that we're going to do the math a certain way. My son, one of my children is in a doctorate program at Georgia Tech here in Atlanta and um, for chemistry. So he's I've had little kids after after my own heart, and they're going for the math and the science, and he has got a major in chemistry, and now he's in a doctorate program for chemistry at Georgia Tech. And while he was getting his degree, he would watch videos for, on YouTube all over the world of people doing science to figure out what he needed to understand. And often they would, they would be people from China, from India, speaking a different language, but when they would write on the board, they wrote using the elements on the periodic table and using the agreed upon methods of math and he could understand it. He didn't need the language part because he understood the language of science. So what we're going to talk about is some of the agreed upon parameters of that language today in physics. So if you got your book, turn to chapter two, follow along. We're going to talk about chapter two. And the first thing that it talks about is the metric system. Now, really it's SI and it comes from French and I'm sure this is perfect French. It's Systeme uh, de International de Units or something like that. But in English, we would say international system of units but they say the system before the international. It's like system international of units, so it's SI. Now, we tend to think of this as the metric system because the metric system and SI almost overlap perfectly. Um, there's just a little bit of things that are a little bit different, So, um, but that's what we use in science. Um, as I grew up, back in the 70s and 80s, um, we used the English system here. We had milk in gallons. We measured out in miles, Fahrenheit, degrees, inches, feet, ounces, pounds, cups, teaspoons, all of those things. And then they came along and they decided they were going to switch us to the metric system that would be like the rest of the world. And they would, they would start introducing it into our society. So I remember the first thing I ever saw was Coke, Coca-Cola. And it came in a one liter bottle, not two. And I was like, huh, that's just a weird thing. Why don't they sell it in courts? But um, then came out the two liter. So when, as I grew up, I knew metric was the weird one and English was the normal one and I could keep them straight and, and my generation could keep them straight and do a pretty good job. Um, your generation has grown up with both. You're just as familiar with milking gallons as Coke and two liter bottles. But what I have found is because they have mixed the two systems together for you guys that y'all don't know either one good at all. Y'all are just a mess. And I used to say that at, when they make me queen of math and science, that at midnight we're going metric. And the reason why is because it's easier to convert units in the metric system. And then this having two things equally used is just confusing everybody. But now I start watching that show on TV, The Great British Bake, Bake Show, Bake Off with Paul Hollywood, and I'm watching them use the English system, and it is not that, that they've gone to metric, and it's just not working for them. They're, they're, it's just awkward. Um, they don't have good in-between measurements, and like they even say their weight in stones. What in the world does that mean? I don't even know. But they, their, their cooking is just so awkward because they don't have our cups and teaspoons and um, all the things that we use when we cook. And um, so now I have a new plan when they make me queen of math and science, which I don't know how that's going to happen because it's not a real position. But um, I think we need two systems. I think we need to use metric or SI in, the, in science 100%. But I think in our everyday living, we should just completely go back to all English. Gallons, ounces, pounds, you know, all of that stuff. 
and just have two different systems, one for everyday living, the English system, because it's very convenient. It actually has good measurement. And then one for science, the metric system. Um, and, and I think we can do it because I found out that in Japan, they have different counting systems depending on what they're counting. Like we got one, two, three, four. They've got something else. If they're counting something different, they have a different way of counting. And if the Japanese can keep that straight, we can keep two systems of units straight, right? I think so. So when I get to be queen of math and science, that's what I think we should do. All right. So the metric system, how does it work? I've got it. I can do a little pre-writing on the board for you today. Oop, my little board. I got my big board behind me. All right. Uh, I'll scoot over so you can see the board more. All right, so I think this is what, what I'm going to show you now is why the metric system is great. Okay, so it, how the metric system works is you have prefixes and then base units. So the base units are like the gram, the liter, the meter, the second. That one's the same. And our system is called English or Imperial. Theirs is called metric or SI. Um, so that one's the same, second. Um, but anyway, that the basic unit are these in the middle, and they are based on either a real thing, like a standard, and they used to have it in France, like they had one meter stick that was considered the right one, and all others are a copy of that. Now they have, they thought, well, what about if that meter stick, something happens to it, or if it gains or loses a few molecules, then it wouldn't be the same. So now a lot of those measurements they are putting on like instead a certain wavelength of light, something that wouldn't change. But there's a standard in France because that's considered the, the center of scientific learning because back in the 1700s, Anton Lavoisier, he's, he discovered oxygen there and it was really the you know, um, Marie Curie and her husband, they worked there and it was really the center of scientific discovery for a very long time. Now that sort of spread out. We have a lot of discovery here in America and um, other places too. So, but it was traditionally the seat of science learning. Okay, so we have these basic metric measurements and you add prefixes to change it. And I think you're probably familiar with this. So the basic unit of length is meter, but then, and that's the basically almost the same as a yard. It's like three inches more. It's like 39 inches instead of 36. But then you have um, a hundredth of that, which is about as big as your pinky and it's a centimeter. So, the, so we have that prefix centi, C-M, CM is a centimeter, or NM is millimeter, and that's about as close as you can get your fingers together without them touching, okay? So we add, and then like kilo means a thousand, that's a thousand meters, and that's what they measure instead of miles. It's less than a mile. So like I run a 5K at least a couple of times a week, and it sounds very impressive, but it's only three miles. Uh, so it sounds more impressive to say, I ran a 5K instead of I ran three miles. But I run it's slightly over three miles, and I actually do it the whole 5K because races, road races around here are 5K, 10K, stuff like that. So I sort of want to know my time as it would compare to other racers because I ran cross country in high school, and I owned third place. It was mine, but never could get first or second. But as I'm getting older, then, um, you know, people quit running. They get bad knees or whatever, and they quit running. So I'm kind of getting better for my age division. And if I just hang in there long enough, I might even win in my age division. There's a race around here that they have at Halloween, and it's at night, and people wear the little glowy stuff, and you get a glow-in-the-dark t-shirt. And I looked up the statistics, and I might could win that one. And I know I could get second, but if not, third place, that one's always mine. Okay, so... Back to back on track. So kilometers are less than a mile, but that's what would be on. Okay, so we've got this. And so how it works is, and this is the beauty of the metric system. Now, how I remember this little thing is this little mnemonic device, and it's King Henry's daughter bakes delicious chocolate muffins. So say it again. King Henry's daughter. Imagine King Henry. Imagine his daughter. You can you can do the frog prince. Okay, so remember the king for the Mardi Gras and frog and the princess and the frog. Remember his daughter, the blonde one who really wanted to marry, who really wanted to be a princess. Okay, she bakes delicious chocolate muffins. So imagine the muffins. My muffins I'm imagining are chocolate, chocolate, a chocolate muffin with chocolate chips. And let's put some butter on it. Mmm, I could eat it right now. Okay, so you've got the thing in your head. 
Then, how you change from one unit to another is very easy, and I call it frog hopping. We're going to be, so now we're thinking about the frog and Princess and the Frog. I just love that Disney movie. I think it is my favorite princess movie. For a long time, it was Sleeping Beauty, but now I think it's Princess and the Frog. It's just wonderful everywhere. Okay, so here's my frog prince. There he is. And to change from one unit to another, I just have to see how many frog hops it is and in what direction. So I'm starting here with decameter. See how it's a big D? Little d is deci. Deci, centi, milli. All the things that end in E go together. So kilo, hecto, deca. These go over here together. So I'm going from deca to milli. So how many frog hops is it? Well, my frog's starting here at deca, and he goes one, two, three, four frog hops to where he's landing here at Millie. So I take my decimal point. I've got 42 in the decimal points right here, and I go four frog hops in the same direction. One, two, three, four, and I augment zeros. That's fancy math talk for. I draw some zeros where there aren't any um, to get the number, and it's 420,000 millimeters. Now, so as long as it's in this kilo, hecto, deca, basic, deci, centi, milli, you can just frog hop, and it's so easy. It's like no math needed, just frog hops. And then you think about how you want to watch the movie and how you want to sing the song. When I'm human and I'm going to be. All right, and it's all great and fun. Okay, so that is why it's so terrific. Now, in your book, it talks about other Oh, let's talk about this. So gram is the basic unit of mass. Kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. Liter, you know about liters. You buy Coca-Cola or root beer or whatever you buy in liter bottles. You buy it in two liters. The one liter is the standard of volume. The meter length, second time, and there's more of them in your book. You can look at it, okay? Um, then the next thing is, uh, in your book, it has some other units that are beyond the parameters of King Henry's Daughter da Bakes Delicious Muffins. You can see Pico, Nano, Micro, um, and then you've got Terra, Giga, Mega. So these are on the outsides of these. The Terra, Mega, um, Giga is um, over here, and the um, micro, nano, pico or over here, very, very small. So I wanted to show you how you can change those. And this is how you can change any unit, anytime, anywhere that you want to change is this method. And it is called dimensional analysis, okay? So what I'm going to change is one micrometer. It's this U. It's actually a Greek letter. It's like a U with a tail on it. I don't know if y'all can see that on my board. But anyway, it's sort of a fancy cursive -y looking U and sometimes it's got a tail in front. So one micrometer to meters. I'm going to change it to meters. So that's, no, I'm going to start with meters and I'm going to change it to micrometers, okay? So I have four meters and I want to know how many micrometers or micrometers that is, okay? That's my question right there. How you do a conversion problem like this is you always start with what you're given. I call it what you know, and you write it down right there. Then you draw what I call railroad tracks, and I know it doesn't really look like railroad tracks, but it's what it's called in chemistry, and uh, that's where I started teaching this first. I, I taught physical chemistry, but I taught biology very first. In college, I taught biology. I taught the study class, and, and, I, taught, then, and I taught chemistry labs, and then, then I taught chemistry, so... Uh, we sort of learned this the chemistry way. All right, so which is a good way. So first you write down what you know. So if we were in class together, I'd say, what do we write down first? What we, and I wanted you to say, no, what you know. So you start with what you're given. And I was given four meters that I, and it's what you want to change. Then you draw these railroad track things. And the reason why I do that and not parentheses the way a lot of books show is I have taught for decades. We won't talk about how many. And kids write so messy that the parentheses end up being sixes or whatever. They tend to do better and keep it straight when you draw these little boxes instead. So draw the boxes. You have bad handwriting. I know you need the boxes. So first you write down what you know with units. I have four meters. Next, you write the units of what you know down here. See how I wrote an M for meter? 
Then you write what you want to change it to up here. And I want micrometers, micrometers, you say it sometimes. Um, and so I do that symbol there. And then you write the relationship. And the relationship is one micrometer is, or micrometer is 10 to the negative six meters. So you write the numbers that go with it. You can use this to change time. You can find out how many seconds there are to your birthday. You could change inches to centimeters. You could use Fahrenheit degrees. As long as you know the relationship, you can set up the conversion factor. Then there's a rule in math that if you have the same thing on the numerator and in the denominator, you get to mark it out, cancel it out. So my M's got canceled out. Any number on top gets multiplied, any number on bottom gets divided. So in your calculator, you would do four times one divided by 10 to the negative six. And you would get this answer, four million micrometers or four million micrometers. Um, and uh, now, if it's a one, you don't really have to do it because anything multiplied or divided by one is itself. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Sometimes you have to do more than one conversion factor in a row if you don't know the relationship. Say you're trying to change um, meters to inches. I would first change meters to centimeters and then change centimeters to inches because I know the relationship that there's 2.54 um, centimeters in an inch. But I don't know off the top of my head how many inches are in a millimeter in a meter exactly. I know it's about 39 inches, but it's not exact. So um, I would go from one to the other before I get to the last one. Um, okay, so the next little concept here is called scientific notation. And this is gonna be on our calculator. Remember, I want you to have for this class a TI-84 scientific calculator. And if you're taking al algebra or geometry from me, you're gonna need it anyway. And I know they're expensive, they're a hundred bucks but you can get them on sale in the summertime right now for 80 so and you can get them used off of ebay for 50 um but a lot of times they're broken let me tell you over the years of teaching i've had lots of kids buy them off of ebay and it seems like a good deal until the calculator is broken and then there's no getting your money back after a certain amount of time and sometimes it takes you a while to figure out your calculator is broken has had that happen more than once. So I sort of recommend getting them new now because they're a lot, but it is the last calculator you will have to buy. It will take you all the way through graduate school. From now, this is the only one. And then at the end, they're usually worth some money and you can sell it. So uh, you need one of these calculators. All right, so let me show you. All. So on the calculator, I talked about putting in 10 times 10, 10 times um, to the exponent negative six, um, 10 to the negative six power. There is a video in my channel that is up close on the calculator that shows you how to put in exponents. It's in my Algebra One playlist. I posted it yesterday. So look for the one that was posted the day before this is posted and you'll find it. And it's how to put exponents in your calculator. If you don't know how, go watch it. Even if you know how, you might want to go watch it because i show you a few little tricks with it. Okay, the next thing is scientific notation. Um, our calculator can do math on bigger and smaller numbers than the display screen can show. So we needed a way to do a, to do, make numbers shortcut, uh, a shorthand for numbers so that we can put it in the calculator and it can do the math on it. So this is called scientific notation. And it also is good for something we're going to talk about in a minute called significant figures, or as the cool kids call it, sig figs. And you and me, we're going to be cool kids. All right, so this is scientific notation. And this is the format. You do a non-zero digit, then a decimal point, then other non-zero digits or significant digits, which that will make more sense in a second, Times. Now, I know in algebra, I told you that we don't use X's for times anymore. They're variables. We use a dot or we use parentheses or we use a number sitting next to a letter. But this is the one place we actually still use the X to mean times. So it's a number times 10 
to an exponent. So let me show you how it works. I've got this big number, one, two, three, zero, 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 and I'm going to put it in scientific notation. So first of all, I need to see the decimal point is right here. My little pen here is dying. It's right there. And we're going to see how many times our frog prince is going to hop till he gets, the because the decimal is the frog prince, how many times he's going to hop until he's in his proper position right behind the one, the this first non-zero digit. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. He hopped six times. So this number written in scientific notation is 1.23 times 10 to the 6th power. Now, how do you put that in your calculator? You, on your TI-84, there is this button right there that's a comma that my finger is on. Behind the button, it is painted capital E, capital E. That stands for exponential notation, uh, scientific notation. So how I put this in my calculator, you know, turn it on, I would put in this first part, 1.23. Let me clear everything out so you can see exactly what I'm doing. 1.23, see that's on my calculator, 1.23, try to get where there's not a glare, Ooh, kind of there. All right, and then I do second comma, and that puts an E there. That E means times 10. So I put 1.23 EE, which means times 10, and now I put to the sixth power, and I just put in six. I don't do up, I just put in six. And that, that's my calculator, will recognize it as that number. Now, this number I can put in my calculator, but bigger ones than that, I might not be able to. If I hit enter, it takes it back out. Let's see if I can get where it's not a good glare. It takes it back out of scientific notation. Some calculators will put them in and out. The old TI-25, it would put it in and out. It'd do your, it'd do your test for you, but the new ones, they'll, they'll take it out sometimes, but it won't put it in. Um, before you would put it in this way and then do EE -E equals and it would do it for you. All right, so let's do this. Let's change this number. What if it's very, very small? Then we count how many frog hops till its proper position, which is after the one. One, two, three, four, five, six. It was six again. Sorry, I didn't do a very good job picking my example. So it's 1.23 times 10 to the negative 6. If it's negative, the number is very, very small, way smaller than 1. If it's positive, the number is very, if the exponent is negative, the number is very, very small, smaller than 1. If the exponent is positive, then it's very, very big, way bigger than 1. And I think it's better for kids to remember it that way then trying to remember that if it's this, you go to the left. If it's that, you go to the right. Because they end up getting it mixed up. Just understand what you're doing. If it's a negative exponent, it is a number that's way smaller than one. If it's a positive exponent, it's way bigger. All right. So we've talked about significant figures. Oh, the other thing is, uh, no, no, I'm not there yet. Never mind. All right. So in your book, it, ta it has you do math with... Um, with scientific notation for the example problems and changing between units and stuff. If it's, um, I want you to um, practice um, example problem one on page 17. Make sure you understand how they did the conversion. It is one they could have done frog hopping, but they did it like dimensional analysis. Make sure you can do it both ways. The next thing is they give you a bunch of problems that to do with scientific notation, and they teach you how to do it without a calculator. I don't care if you can do it without a calculator. I want you to be able to do it with your calculator. So I want you to practice all those problems using your calculator and make sure you know how to put it in and get the right answer. Okay. The next idea is um, this idea that is... Um, accuracy and precision. And they tell you the idea of parallax. And what parallax is, is that different, if you're looking at something from a different position, then it, then, then different positions can give you a, a different, um, look at what is really going on. So if, if you've ever been sitting on a bus 
and the bus beside you starts going forward, but suddenly you feel like you're going back, that's sort of an effect of parallax because um, you thought you were moving when you were still really the other bus was moving. Another one is, say you are sitting in a car that's moving, but you look, you can't see outside, you look down at your book, it appears that your book is still. But if you were standing outside of the um, car and looking, then you can see that that book is moving along with the car. So, parallax is a shift in the position of an object when it is viewed from various angles. Um, gas gauges are like that. You'll be sitting there and in the passenger seat and you go you look over because your kid's driving and you go, Eli, do we need gas? It looks like we need gas. And he looks down and says, no, mom, we got a quarter tank. We're fine. We will get gas on the way back. So depending on where you're sitting, things can look different. One of these, if you, you normally you would take chemistry before physics. And in chemistry, you'll remember that when you look at a graduated cylinder, you always bring it up to your eye to read it because if you, if you leave it sitting down and you're up above, you won't read it correctly. You have to read it at eye level from the bottom of the meniscus, if you remember that. All right, and then the next idea is the idea of accuracy and precision. Accuracy is how close your measurement is to the truth. So we want accurate measurements in science. Precision is how finely stated it is or how repeatable it is. So say I've got a bullseye and I shoot the arrow at the bullseye and three times I hit way over here, nowhere near the bullseye. I told you it was me shooting it, right? And, but I hit it three times right in the same place. That would be very, ac very precise, but not accurate. Another one be, it would be if I had a broken balance. And it says that this um, thing I'm weighing, that I'm getting the mass off, it tells me to four decimal places. It would be very precise, but it's broken and it is not accurate. So what we strive for in science is both accuracy and precision. And of the two, it's more important to be accurate than precise, but we want precision too. Now, um, that brings us to our next topic, which is significant digits. In science, we want to have academic integrity, academic honesty. And when we are reporting our findings in science, we don't want it to look like they are better than they are. Say we did not have very expensive equipment and we weighed something, we got its mass on the balance, but our balance only went to the gram. It didn't even go to the tenth or the, the hundredth or a thousandth of a gram. It was only to the gram. And we were getting the, its density. Density, I wrote it up here somewhere. Did I erase it? Uh, no, I wrote it on here. I was like, where'd it go? Here we go. <laughs> density is mass over volume right there. And so say I got my mass just to the gram, and then I divided it by the volume right here, and I put it in my calculator, mass divided by volume, and it came out with lots and lots of decimal points. I don't write down the density as having all those decimal points because it looks like I used a better balance than I did. It would be dishonest. So we have to decide how much do you round, and that is called, and knowing what that is, is it has to do with the concept of what is called significant figures. And the, the rules with significant figures tell you how far to round. Now there's one more point about this density equals mass over volume I want to bring out that these units, grams, liters, meters, seconds, those are all um, basic units, they're base units. But you can also have derived units, like the unit for density is grams per milliliter. The unit for speed, miles per hour. Those are derived units. They're units where you do the math by putting it into the formula and you do the same math on the units. So if you want to know your miles per hour, you would measure your miles, you would measure your time, how many hours it is, you would divide those two numbers and you also divide the units per means division. Now, notice how I wrote my per as a slash there. I want you to only do that if it's letters, if it's units. Otherwise, if you're doing math, I want flat 
fraction bars. Why? Why can't you write one half like that? No. The reason why is because students will write one half like that, and in just a skinny minute, that turns into 112. Because their handwriting is so bad, and they don't pay attention to what they're doing, it doesn't work. So for, for this class and from now on, I want you to always, if it's a number, do flat fraction bars. See, I can help you save a world of hurt, as my daddy would say. Okay, next idea. Okay, is significant digits. So how do you know how to round? The rules are written in your book on page 23. And how you round is you cannot make your answer have more significant digits than your data had. So how do you know if a digit is significant or not? You look at the rules on the bottom of page 23. First of all, non-zero digits are always significant. This will make more sense when I start showing you the example. So just remember, the only thing that we have to figure out if it's significant or not are zeros. So when are zeros significant and when are they not? Because if it's not a zero, it is significant. It was measured. Okay. All final zeros after a decimal point are significant. Let's see. I wrote some up here to show you. So right here I have 20.00. Those two zeros are significant because they're final zeros after a decimal point. The next one is zeros between two other significant digits are always significant. So that zero right here is between an eight and a four. Non-zero digits are always significant. Because it's in between, it is significant. Rule number uh Four, I think I said that one wrong. Um, zeros used solely for spacing the decimal point are not significant. So these zeros right here at the beginning, they are considered to be placeholders and they're not significant. So let's go through. So this number has four significant figures. The zero is significant because it's between two non-zero numbers. This one has three significant figures because none of them are zeros, so they all count. This one, the zeros are in the beginning, so they don't count, only has two significant figures. This one, the zeros at the end count because they're after a decimal. So this zero is between a significant figure two and, is, and that zero, which is significant. And zeros in the middle of significant figures are significant, so that one is four. Okay, this one, these in the front don't count. Zeros in the front don't count after a decimal point. Three counts because it's not zero. That zero counts because it's in between non-zero numbers. So this is four. If it had another zero here, it would be five because zeros at the end after a decimal count. This one has two. One reason why we put things in scientific notation is to show what is significant and what's not. If we took this number out of scientific notation, it would be, there's one frog hop. It would be four six and four zeros. How do we know if those zeros are significant or not? If there's a decimal point at the end, they're significant. But say, what if we two of them were measured and two were not? Then we can put it in scientific notation, 4.600 zero, zero, times 10 to the fifth, and you would know that those two zeros were not measured, okay? This one has three significant figures, so, and that one has two. So by using scientific notation, we can show whether or not the numbers were measured or not, and we can be more honest with our science. We wanna be honest scientists. All right, so that is, read over that, look at the example problems, make sure you understand them. Now, there are answers in the back of your book to the in-text questions. So those are the ones I'm going to give you for homework. I want you to do the problem, then check your answer in the back of the book. Do the problem, check your answer in the back of the book. It's just like in algebra. I only assign the odd ones because they have the answer in the back of the book. And the point of doing homework is to learn. Homework is not a test. The test is to show what you know. Now, what if you just turn to the back of the book and write down all the answers? Could you do that? Sure. Are you learning? No. Are you going to fail the test? You bet. 
So the reason why we do homework is to learn, and you need to get this in your head right now. When you go to college, you need to do those problems where the answers are in the back of the book and check it and make sure. Don't do a whole problem page of math wrong. Do a problem, check it. Do a problem, check it. Don't put it in your head the wrong way. Same thing with physics. Physics is just word problems, let's be honest. So do, do a problem, check it. Do a problem, check it. Okay, that's how I want you to do it. And that's how you're going to really learn. All right, so the next thing is how do we display data? A lot of times in science, we do it with graphs. Um, uh, there are, I have YouTube videos also teaching you how to graph in my math. So you could Google that. So do, there's other videos about graphing if you need it. The big thing that you're learning here that I wanted to show you is when you do a graph, where did I write? Oh, over here, here's my graph. Um, you have your Y and your X axis. You put the independent variable on the x-axis, you put the dependent variable on the y-axis. What do I mean by that? The thing that is not changed in your experiment goes on the x. So like if you're doing a graph of distance versus time, there is nothing in the world we can do to change time. It just goes. We can't, we can't go back in time, no matter that about all those sci-fi movies that show we can, we can't. And there's nothing we can do to change it. We can't speed it up. We can't slow it down. Time is independent. It, it is not dependent on anything. So whatever is independent, not changed, goes on X. What is changed, what we do the experiment on, is called the dependent variable. It does change, and it goes on the Y axis. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go watch one of the videos on how to graph and what's the X and what's the Y. All right, so look at that in your book. Um and make sure you understand it. I think that, okay. There is a lab that you can do on page 28. Um, for to, <clears throat> to be able to do it, you need a digital scale. I got mine off eBay for $10, and it, and it measures to the tenth or maybe even the hundredth of a gram. So you need to get one. You know, if you're going to get the calculator, get the balance too, because what we're going to use a lot in this class is we're going to weigh stuff. We're going to need to get its mass in grams. So look on eBay. Um, I think that they sell those scales um, all the time, and uh, maybe next time I'll remember and I'll show you what mine looks like that I got. Mine can also measure carrots and um, things like that for weighing jewelry. And it can do ounces too. So it's a really good little scale for $10. Wasn't bad at all. Um, but anyway, what you do in this lab is you will get, they want, they want you to get three pieces of wire and measure it and then compare it um, to its mass. So you measure how long it is with your centimeter ruler you need for this class, and then you measure it on your scale and you compare the mass to its length, and then you graph it. Now, what if you don't have any wire? Get something else. Get something else that you can get that are the same and that you can have three different lengths of it. Uh, spaghetti noodles. Um, find something else. You can do it. I'm all about substituting and not buying new things. And then they did the same thing and they took tiles like what you could, you know, put in your bathroom or whatever. And they figured out its area and way and did, got its mass and compared area to mass. Um, what if you don't have any tiles? Well, you can get them real cheap at Home Depot, like less than a dollar each. Or Go find something else that are the same thickness, very similar, but would have different areas. So feel free to substitute materials. Um, there are a few things you're going to need. You're going to need your centimeter ruler. You need a, 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 a balance. Um, you're going to need graph paper and pencils and colored pencils, and you're going to need your calculator. But if it's just that we are wanting to compare links of things to mass and areas of things to mass, you can find something else other than there's nothing holy about what they picked for this lab. So I want you to do that lab for homework. And the homework is always down in the description. Um, and it also talks about some math concepts of linear versus quadratic versus inverse. Let me show you what I mean by that real quick. This is a little math review concept. I'm going to erase this and write it on here for you. Okay, so if something is linear, 
then this equation will be, uh, will, if you graphed it, it'll be a line, a straight line, and it would be something like this, y equals 2x plus 3. Um, notice that neither the y nor the x are raised to any exponents, so I know when I look at this that if I graphed it, it would be, I could actually graph it, it looks something like that, okay? And your your calculator that you're going to need for this class is a graphing calculator, and it will do your graphs for you. And I'm gonna you're gonna need to go watch the Algebra One and Algebra Two um, playlist. You need to watch all the calculator labs I post, cause you cause if you don't know how to use this calculator, you gotta learn how. If you've already had me for Algebra One and Algebra Two, you should know all of that already. You've already done all the calculator labs, but maybe you forgot, so you can go back and watch the videos too. But if you're a new student, you need to go watch my Algebra One and Algebra Two graphing um gra uh, calculator labs. Okay. All right, so if there are no exponents, what shape is our graph going to be? A straight line. Okay, the next one is if x is squared, then it's not a straight line anymore. This is now a quadratic equation, and quadratic equations, if you have the positive and negative, make a U shape, a parabola. A lot of times in physics, we only deal with with the positives, like time. We can't go back in time. It can't be negative. Distances, um, they can be negative from a point, but, but they're not really negative. Um, distances are more an absolute value. So, um, because like I say it's two miles from my house to the library, and it's two miles from the library to my house, I don't say it's negative two miles from the library to my house. Um, your book kind of does negative distances, but they're doing it from a starting point. They, they say it's positive and negative, but different books do this a little bit different, but this is more of the trend now. Okay, so if it's squared, you get that parabolic shape. The next one is if it is an inverse. The way the Algebra 2 book teaches it is like this. Whoops. And what it means is that x is in numerator land, but I mean, x is in denominator land, y is in numerator land. That one is in the numerator and one is in the denominator. So like if we had this and we graphed it, it would go down like that and not reach zero. So look at those graphs in your book. Make sure you kind of remember that from Algebra 2. Um, but we will do, you'll learn more about these as we get on into more problems. We'll be using trig in this class. So you need to be either, um, to do physics, you need to have either had Algebra 2 or in Algebra 2. If you are not Algebra 2 level, you need to drop out of this class and go back to chemistry or biology or physical science. You're not ready for this. The math's going to be too hard. This is a math Advanced math class is considered a rigor class here in Georgia where I am. So um, make sure that you're mathematically ready for it. Um, you either need to be taking Algebra 2 or have had Algebra 2. All right, let's see. Okay, the next thing your book talks about is they like to solve an equation for a variable. For example, did, did I get rid of my density? Yes, I did. So in our formula, let's see where I have room. Uh, right over there. Okay, in our formula, I'm going to turn around, it's probably going to knock something down. Uh, density equals mass over volume. What I want you to do is I want you to write down your formula the regular straight way, and then I want you to substitute the numbers in, and then I want you to manipulate it and solve for, for your variable. Your book talks about rearranging formulas, and I don't want you to ever do that, and this is why. I, my degree is in biochem, so, and I also teach physics. I've had lots of physics, so I teach physics, I teach biology, I teach chemistry, I teach math, and in, and I teach, I teach algebra two, I teach algebra one, I teach geometry, I teach pre-algebra. In those eight classes that I teach often, there are literally hundreds of formulas. If you rearrange your formula before you substitute, you will turn this one formula into three formulas. Because say if I want to um, know what mass would be, then I would say, why is mass not alone? And I would say, because it's being divided by volume, and I would mark those out, and I would have mass equals density times volume. And if I wanted what volume is, then I'd say, why is it not alone? Well, it's because 
it is being multiplied by density, and I would divide both sides by density, and I would say volume equals mass over density. I have just turned one formula into three formulas. If you do that, you're going to have too many formulas to ever memorize them. If every single time you use a formula, you write it its most famous way, so like you write e equals mc squared, you don't rearrange it. Density is mass over volume, you don't rearrange it. Speed is distance over time, you don't rearrange it. Then by the time you're old like me, as a scientist, you will memorize your formulas. And it's so convenient to have your formulas memorized. So no matter what Algebra 2 book or Algebra 1 book or physics book tells you to re rearrange it first, don't do it. Use your formula straight. Sing the song Substitute by The Who. It's before my time and yours, but it will help you to remember to substitute. Substituting your givens, solve for the variable you don't know. And that will make your life much better. So just know, we're not going to rearrange formulas. All right, let's see the next thing. Mm, we're not solving it for that. Nope, nope, nope. Not going to do it. Not going to make me. We already talked about the units. All right, that's chapter two. So you're going to have problems to do for homework. I'll write it in the description in the lab. Come back next week and we'll learn another chapter of physics. Science is great. See you soon.